Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. Vedic by K.J. Heritage The dead don't always die. Top company scientist Chin Jelinek has committed suicide. Vedic, a half-alive empath with no memory of who or what he is, will die in six hours if he can't find out why, or so the company tells him, an added incentive to get the job done. Our hero soon discovers he is one of the skilled, a genetically enhanced human revered and despised in equal measure, a bloodhound with a terrifying past who'll stop at nothing in his pursuit of the truth. And the skilled always get their guy, don't they? Vedic, number one, by KJ Heritage, on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. KJ Heritage's uncanny sense of pacing and story puts him at the forefront of today's speculative fiction writers. Gritty, intense, and compelling, Vedic is something you don't run into often enough in sci-fi, a cerebral thrill ride you don't want to end. Prepare to lose sleep reading Vedic, delicious science fiction. That's what other people are saying about it. Find out for yourself. Vedic, the first book in the series by K.J. Heritage. Jasper T. Scott, his box set Dark Space, the complete series. This is six books bundled together on sale now for 99 cents. Six complete books, over 600,000 copies sold. More than 2,000 pages of epic space opera for the low price of 99 cents, also available in Kindle Unlimited if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Humanity is defeated. Ten years ago, the Scythians invaded the galaxy with one goal, to wipe out the human race. Now the survivors are hiding in the last human sector of the galaxy, dark space, once a place of exile for criminals, now the last refuge of mankind. The once galaxy-spanning Imperium of Star Systems is left guarding the gate which is the only way in or out of dark space, but not everyone is satisfied with their governance. Freelancer and ex-convict Ethan Ortain is on the run. He owes crime lord Alec Barandi 10,000 souls, and his ship is badly damaged. When Brandi catches up with him, he makes an offer Ethan can't refuse. Ethan must infiltrate and sabotage the Valiant, the Imperial Star System's fleet carrier which stands guarding the entrance of dark space, and then his debt will be cleared. While Ethan is still undecided about what he'll do, he realizes that the Imperium has been lying and putting all of Dark Space at risk. Now Brondi's plan is starting to look like a necessary evil, but before Ethan can act on it, he discovers that the real plan was much more sinister than what he was told, and he will be lucky to escape the Valiant alive. Grab all six books for 99 cents right now. Dark Space, the complete series by Jasper T. Scott. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady. Survivor, Mother, Leader, and Humanity's Last Chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle, and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the Unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them. But now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light. And that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out, not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future 
or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Elizabeth LeBan on the show with me. She has a fantastic new book. It's been out for a couple of days now. It's called Beside Herself, and uh, really is a great book. Uh, welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to have you. Um, Elizabeth, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be an author or a storyteller? So my first memory, um, I've always been a big reader, but when I read the S.E. Hinton books when I was in middle school, um, The Outsiders, and that was then, this is now in particular, and I, it was the first time I ever read a story and was so absorbed by it that when I was finished with it, I missed it desperately. I have had that experience since, but that was the first time I ever had that experience. And it was the first, I can picture where I was, and it was the first time I thought, you know, if I could ever do this and, you know, draw people in and create a world that people want to spend time in with people they like to, to be, you know, be with and um, even miss when they're finished with a book, then that's what I want to do. So that was really the moment when I thought this was a magical thing. I didn't know if I'd ever be able to do it, but it was definitely the first time I thought, I'd like to think about trying. Well, and knowing that she was so young when she wrote that story and that it connected, I think that connected that story really deeply with a lot of young people too and, and maybe yeah. took some of the um, uh, some of the fear away that this was something that, that we all can do. We all can, uh, you know, um, connect with other people and we don't have to be 50 years old and have gained – Right. all of this life experience, although that's great, but you know, yeah. it, it can be done. It's true. Her story is so interesting because she was so young. Although I don't think I even realized that until a number of years later, which then just made it all even more exciting. Right. Right. Um, were you a, a bookish kid uh, as you were younger? I love to read. Um, I always did. I loved mysteries. When I was younger, I loved the, the Encyclopedia Brown book. I always wanted to oh, write. Those were my history. absolute favorites. Yeah, I love those. I love them. Um, I just love to read. And I can still remember some stories that stuck with me. Um, and sometimes I even try to find them. Some I can, you know, the S.E. Hinton books. And I've read those books many times since. But others I still sort of search for, um, you know, because they just they were they had such an impact on me. But I've really always loved to read. After reading uh, the Essie Hinton books and, and feeling like this, this thing had been lit inside you, um, did you, did you start formulating a plan? Like, I'm, this is something I'm going to pursue and this is how I'm going to go about it? Um, I mean, that's such a good question, but I, I don't think so. I think it was so overwhelming that even much later in adulthood, I couldn't fathom writing a whole novel um, for a long time, but I always wanted to write and I would always, you know, try to begin a book or come up with a title or design a cover. Um, and then my senior year of high school, we got to write a lot and I love that and decided to major in English and specifically writing in college. And then I went on to journalism school, which I think, you know, it's a very different type of writing from fiction, obviously, but I um I, I think it added to to my wanting to write and I learned how to write fast and hopefully you know using the most important words and um you know so that all sort of added into it and then I sort of started writing a children's book I mean so much later I was you know I was in my 30s and um and then that sort of morphed into more that sort of gave me the the that book I have not ever really tried to get published it's just something that I love and then I went on and I wrote um, other books and The Restaurant Critic's Wife and The Tragedy Paper and was lucky enough to to eventually get them published. Um, I've, I've, I know uh, several writers, quite a few, uh, that uh, went to journalism school and spent time in journalism. And I'm always fascinated by how uh, 
how journalism, or at least the the mindset of, of journalists, uh, can can feed into fiction writing. And do you feel like that there are, are tools and skills that you picked up there that help you as a fiction writer, even though we know the two shouldn't be related? But uh, you know, does journalism teach you to to be a better listener, a better observer? For me, I would say absolutely. I mean, there are a few there are a few different things that come to mind. Although so much of it, I think, feeds into it. Um, obviously, when you're writing for a newspaper or for the news, it, you have to be accurate. It's completely nonfiction. Um, so that's the huge difference. And then the freedom that I have writing fiction, I can write anything. The characters can do anything or take a different turn from what you would expect. Um, so that's obviously obviously the biggest difference. But ways that it's helped me so much. Um, one, writing dialogue, you know, talking to people all the time and paying attention to the way they talk. Um, when I was working for newspapers and, you know, never changing a quote, but very carefully listening to what they say, every word, every pause, definitely helped me um, sort of think about the different rhythms people have and the different voices that I could then translate to a fictional character. Um, and I think also, you know, this idea of showing and not telling is important in both both genres, writing for newspapers, writing news of, and writing fiction. And that's something that I think about all the time, um, no matter what type of writing I'm doing. And I think just being able to write fast and, yes, observe, think about all the details that um, might go into a fictional character, um, you know, because when, when you're writing the news, you're, you know, or reporting a story, I pay close attention to that, to the, you know, whatever I'm, whatever the story might be. Um, so I think all of that helped me become a fiction writer without question. So after college, after, you know, acquiring your toolkit, um, how did you, uh, how did you start your writing career? Um, not necessarily novel writing, but how did you, you know, get into the daily work of writing? That's such a good question. It's 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 interesting. It it was very lucky. So um, the year before my junior and senior year of college, I was an intern at the Today Show at NBC, which was a thrill um, and sort of opened up a door um, that I didn't really know that much about, you know, broadcast news. And I initially went in that direction and I worked at NBC after college as a page um, and you, you, I don't know if you know what that is, but, um, oh yeah, a lot of people know, especially because of the, the show 30 Rock. But so basically we gave tours of the studios, which was very exciting. And we, we helped to seat the different shows that were there at the time, Saturday Night Live. David Letterman was there when I was there. And, um, that was so exciting. And then you got to explore different departments. So I explored the news. I, I had a, a they called it an assignment um, with nightly news. And that was very exciting. And I thought at the time that was the direction that I would take. Um, and after I worked at the, after I was a page, I worked for Jane Pauley. She had a show that was initially called real life with Jane Pauley and that morphed into Dateline. And so I worked there. Um, I assisted her assistant and I also did a little research and I realized that I really wanted to write. And I talked to people um, who were there who advised me to consider going to journalism school to switch from broadcast news to print, to learn more about print, which might seem silly now just because of the state of newspapers, although, you know, some are still great. Um, but that's what I did. So I applied to Columbia Journalism School and I was lucky enough to get in. And there, when I was there, I focused on print journalism, and I loved that. And then after that, I went on to work at a newspaper in the Bronx, the Riverdale Press. And then a few, and then I moved to Pennsylvania, and I worked at um, small daily newspapers here. And that's when I sort of started thinking about doing more freelance and starting to write fiction. Also, that's around the time my kids were born, um, so I was able to have a slightly more flexible schedule. And I started writing fiction and it just, it was, I mean, it's so hard. You know, you, you write one word and you think, okay, one down 90,000 to go, <laughs> which I still think when I begin a, when I begin a novel. Oh God, um, I love, I love hearing that so much because <laughs> I, you know, I, that's one of those things that, you know, people get this idea 
that writers and successful writers, you know, that it's just bliss and joy the entire time. You know, there's there's birds singing on your shoulder and you're just (laughs) lovingly, you know, stroking the keyboard. And my God, it is work some days, isn't it? And it's overwhelming when you're, especially the beginning, you know, you have an idea and, and you start it, but then I don't even know the characters at all, mostly through that first draft. You know, I'm just getting to know them. So, so yeah, so it's, it's hard, especially those first few drafts. And then usually I'll ask my agent to read it or my editor or some trusted friends and they'll see things that I didn't see at all. And then I'll, that's where I am now working on another novel. The first draft is finished. A few people I trust and who have great ideas read it. And now I'm going back to the beginning Um, And I'm not going to, it's not an entire rewrite, but there are so many things I want to work on and change. And then there'll be more drafts. You know, this won't be the last draft. There'll be many. So Elizabeth, tell us about um, the, uh, so you're, you're working in journalism. Uh, You are, you know, doing the daily work as a professional writer, as, you know, someone who's uh, you know, writing for a living, you are a writer. Um, what, when does the call of the novel start <laughs> pestering you again? And, uh, you know, how, how do you then, uh, you know, tackle that first book? That's such a good question. And actually the first book I started is not the first, my first book that was published. Um, as, as true with a lot of people. Yeah, it's definitely true. So I was living in New Orleans and I had this idea to write a children's book about a cat that was adopted by the restaurant critic and his wife, a cat that was homeless and a stray cat and then got to eat all the best food in the city. Um, (laughs) My husband is a restaurant critic. Um, We were living in New Orleans and now we're in Philadelphia. And I thought it was funny and I sort of played with it. I still have a draft. Um, I never did much with it. But then I started thinking, oh, well, what could I, this is, you know, we have all these crazy funny moments in restaurants and, you know, people are asking so many questions about what it's like to be married to a restaurant critic. You know, I thought maybe there's a novel here. So that is one book I wrote in a very different way. I had a lot of ideas and scenes um, and I would, I started to write them down. So I, I didn't, I tend now to write sort of straight through. But with that book, I sort of had ideas. And then I thought, okay, what do I have? Let me think of this as a plot, as a, you know, beginning, middle, and end. Um, so I was working on that. And and I was able to get my agent with that book. He liked it and took me on. And I still work with the same agent. And, um, you know, while we were talking about editing it, and he had sent it out to a few editors who had comments, and it came back to me, um, we had this idea that I should try to write a young adult novel. And I did. I wrote the tragedy paper, and that was published um, in 2013. And that was so exciting. And then um, we thought, let's go back and see, now that I had a book out there, if if we could get The Restaurant Critic's Wife published. I did a full rewrite, um, you know, really thought it through. Now that I had written one novel that was out there, I had a better sense of what, what that might mean. And I was lucky enough to um, get the attention of my editor, who has been my editor now for my last four books, um, the same editor. Um, And my last four books have been women's fiction. So different from the tragedy paper, not not young adult. There's a lot there I want to ask about. Um, (laughs) So the um, the restaurant critic's wife uh, is uh, while it's fiction and uh, and and a lot of times funny fiction. Um, it it does draw a lot from your actual life, or at least yes. inspired by, right? Yes. Um, being that is the kind of the first full length thing that you that you had written, not published, but had written, and you'd been through that process. Then tackling the tragedy paper, um, which is not informed by your immediate life, as best I can tell. Right. Uh, wh- how is that process different from you? I, I think a lot of people their first book. Is really inspired by by our lives uh, because yeah. it's it's what we're so close to. It's the it's the thing that's bubbling up all the time. Is that, you know, and and a lot of times you have to get through that so that you can get to a completely different story. Did did you find that to be true? Did you yeah. need to go through those those personal things that that were so close to the skin, if you will, um, to then get to something that you could just completely make up out of whole cloth? 
Yeah, definitely. And I think if you, if I think of my five novels, it, it's changed with each one. So you're absolutely right. I mean, with The Restaurant Critic's Wife, I was, you know, living it and I thought, oh, this is funny. I'm going to fictionalize this. I'm going to write a scene, you know, with this and, and take it to another level. Um, but still sort of in, in reality, only because it came from that point. Um, in, in the end, The Restaurant Critic's Wife is very different. The characters are different from me and my husband. But having said that, of course, much of it comes from experiences, um, you know, initially that, that, I, that I did have. Um, with the tragedy paper, the setting is very much the school that I went to for two years of high school. Um, but the actual story is not. The actual story is completely fictionalized. And that, in a way, is, is much more liberating. Because even though when I do take it from a point of, of reality, I do think there's something that sort of keeps you there. And you really have to think to go beyond it and not and not be stuck. You're not stuck. And, you know, you can do anything with it, even if it comes from a point of reality. So... With the restaurant critic's wife, yes, the most so of being of coming from a point of of real life, and then the tragedy paper a little bit, especially with the setting, and then my next book, Pretty Little World. While the story is made up, um, I did take a lot, and I did that with another author, um, Melissa DePino, and I wrote that together, and we did take a lot from our own neighborhood as far as the setting went, living in a row home in Philadelphia. Um, so even that, there was some reality in the setting and the idea of neighbors being so close. So then with Not Perfect, it was the first time I really took a total leap. And, um, you know, the, the main character, Tabitha, lives in a high-rise building on Rittenhouse Square. That's not something I've ever experienced. Um, and her story is is very different from anything, you know, that I've experienced. And then the same with Beside Herself. Um, it's some, it's a topic that I'm fascinated by, um, you know, in beside herself marriage and, you know, maybe marriage going wrong and, and how do you, how, or how do you handle that? Um, I have witnessed people who have gotten through hard times and other people who just thought, you know, this is a deal breaker. I'm out. And I'm just fascinated by the different choices people make. Having said that, um, it's not, it's not my story. And I think that gave me more freedom. Um, it's fascinating. And then even this next book that I have, this first draft, again, I, I love to take from places. So I always love Philadelphia. I love restaurants that we go to. Um, and in this next book, uh, there, there's a lot of it that takes place in Ocean City, the one I'm working on now. And I love that. But the stories are, are completely made up. And in a way, that's, that's quite liberating. Yeah. Um the the one uh, dip into YA suspense with the tragedy paper. Um, you've been writing women's fiction since then. Um, have you thought oh, about going yeah. back to uh, to kind of revisit the the world of the tragedy paper? I have. I mean, not. I do, I see that as a standalone book. I don't think that I would ever write a sequel, even though. I play with the idea a little bit. I don't think I would. Um, and I do have two drafts of young adult books that I think about going back to. I was lucky enough to get sort of caught up in this women's fiction world, which which I love. Um, and I think about going back, but they were neither of them were good enough in their initial drafts, and I just sort of put them to the side. Um, it is something I think about, yeah. Well, and when you when you've kind of found your niche and and kind of gathered your tribe, um, it's it, it's it's difficult to switch gears like that. And you know, when people are expecting a new Elizabeth LeBand book every year, you know, that's very um, nice. Yeah. Um, so the the new book uh, beside herself. Tell mm -hmm. us. Uh, you you've given us a little bit of the. Uh, you know, kind of some of the reasonings by, you know, getting farther and farther away from your personal experience and exploring things that fascinate you. But, um, you know, how does, uh, how did this book start for you? Um, yeah, it's so interesting. So beside herself is the story of Hannah Bent, who very early in the book discovers that her husband had an affair and it's completely shocking. She had no idea. Um, she finds out by accident, which I guess is how many people find out. And then what do you what do you do? I mean, is it is it the end or can they get through? 
Um, and there are a lot of factors that go into that. It's not an easy answer. Um, of course, it depends on, you know, how her husband handles things, um, you know, and, and, and what she, she does a lot of searching to decide what to do. So, yes, I've, I've always been fascinated by that um, idea, you know, that if you're lucky enough to be married for a long time, some things might come up and might they be a deal breaker or not? And in what situations are they and in what situations are they not? So I really wanted to explore that. Um, Hannah's best friend is recently divorced and she sort of sees that side of it and how hard that can be. Um, and you know, it's just a lot of circumstances very specific to Hannah's life because of course there, there's no easy way to deal with something like that. And, and I'm not at all saying this is the way. Her circumstances are very specific. Um, but I, I enjoyed exploring that um, and then her decision at the beginning or, you know, toward the beginning of the book is, well, if he did it, maybe I can. And so she sort of thinks about making her own connections and maybe having her own affair. And that takes her down a sometimes humorous and, you know, interesting path. It, it's not so easy. And what does that all mean? And where does she maybe find a connection that she didn't expect? Um, and it all leads to the big question, can they or can't they make it work? Right. Um, Elizabeth, when you're uh, when you're thinking of a new book, when when it's just in that embryonic stage, yeah. when, uh, you know, it's just percolating and there's a little kernel of a story there that's just beginning to take root. What usually comes to you first? Is it a character? Is it like Hannah who comes to you or is it, you know, just the thought of um, – you know, I wonder what it's like when a marriage starts unraveling and you just start playing the what if game. Uh, yeah. Is it a setting? Uh, what is usually the first thing that starts to germinate to become a story? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, ultimately, of course, all of those things. But I think sort of the idea first, you know, what happens when, you know, a marriage, you know, it takes a different, a totally unexpected turn. Um, and then Hannah even though I got to know her as I wrote that first and second and third draft. Um, so I wouldn't say she came to me fully formed at all, but her name was right there and I had a sense of her and she's very different from me. Not that, not that I wouldn't, you know, make some choices that she made. I don't mean that at all, but just as a person, she's different. Um, and that, that was sort of fun to, to write. Um, and so, and then the setting, I, I mean, with that book, I knew it was going to be in Philadelphia, like my other women's fiction books, um, but I didn't want it to be in the exact same neighborhood. And I just sort of got to know the family and in my mind and where I imagined they lived. Um, but I think to answer your question, that the story is there, um, you know, just sort of this basic idea of the story. And I don't know, I don't always know where that's going to take me, but um, but I think that's where it starts. Are you ever surprised by uh, what a character of yours does uh, in the story? Definitely. I mean, definitely. And I know that sounds silly because I'm right no, now and I can do anything. But sometimes I do think, oh, you know what? She wouldn't do this. And and then I'll change it or think of it in another way. And that that does happen. Um, and a lot of a lot of times the characters do lead me through a scene or, um, you know, I just have a sense eventually of, you know, that they would do this or not do that. And sometimes it does surprise me because it might not be what I initially set out to do. I've had that happen so many times that you're writing something yeah. and like you said, it just feels contrived. Like this character wouldn't do that. Yeah. And and then you, you erase that and you, you just kind of let go with what you feel that character would do. And it just flows. Yeah. It's uh, it, you know, it, writing is the only thing that we can have a conversation and we can talk about these made up characters that do things on their own and people don't think that we're, you know, crazy. Right. It's, uh, <laughs> it's you know, true. These, are, these become real people, yeah. you know, that inhabit this ethereal space. It's, uh, it, it's so crazy and fun at the same time. I agree. <laughs> so fun. Um, do you, um, so you, you, the way you've described the way you write, um, are you, uh, kind of a discovery writer? Are you, are you discovering the story as you write or like how much planning goes into uh, the story that you're writing? That's such a good question. And that has changed over time. Um, again, with the restaurant critics wife, I had all these scenes and then I, 
sort of thought of it as a whole a little bit later. Um, Finding ways to stitch those scenes together. Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to, you know, like the overall, you know, situation. And with that book, I sort of went through a year. um, And once I came to that, you know, and how things changed for Lila over the year. And once I came to that, it was much easier to to make a whole story. Um, But so with with my most recent novels, I've been lucky enough to show my editor the first three chapters and a detailed synopsis. So that's basically forced me to think through the book, which I think is really, even though I'm not generally a, an outline, I don't like to outline things, um, I think that's been extremely helpful. Having said that, the book I'm working on now is different. I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to write the whole book, not because I had to, um, I think my editor would have very, ha- I know she would have happily looked at three chapters in a detailed synopsis, but I just had the sense that I wanted to get through it. So that I wrote from beginning to end and I did not um, outline it. So, you know, it, it was a different experience. I had some notes that I would sometimes refer to. Um, I don't know which is better, which is more natural for me, um, but I've had both experiences. I've had uh, several friends and, and folks on the show that have have had a similar experience. That it seems a lot of editors are really looking for, uh, you know, a, a synopsis and wanting to know what this book is going to be about yeah. ahead of time. And that seems to be a fairly new thing across the industry. Um, you, you said that you've done both ways and, and don't really have a preference. But do you ever get into the writing? And see, well, I've got this synopsis over here. This this is what I've said it's going to be, but it just doesn't feel right. Oh, do, definitely. Do you, do you ever take a left turn? Definitely, because as we talked about a little while ago, you know, I don't I don't know the characters that well when I set out to write that synopsis, and then when I get to know them better, I can see, oh, that that isn't what they might do or what he he or she might do. Um, so yes, a hundred percent, and I'm very open to that. And my editor has also been very open to that. If something has shifted, even after she said she liked a book, um, because it, these, for me at least, the books go through many, many different drafts and and changes before it gets to a final book. Um, so even with that synopsis, it's it's it, to some extent it's some of it sticks, but to some extent it's a guess. Do you have a feeling for the ending of the book uh, when you begin? A, a lot of times I'll have a almost a fully formed ending for the book in yeah. my mind, and I'm writing toward that. Uh, do you have yeah. an experience like that? Yes. In fact, every single book I've written, I have mostly known how it's going to end. I mean, like bigger picture, um, you know, when I start it. So, so I don't know what the last word will be or the last few pages. Right. But there's an, almost an emotion me. wrapped around it. But I agree with you. I mean, I feel I have this, a similar system. Yes. I, I almost, not that I wouldn't be open to something going a different way, but that just hasn't happened yet. Uh, the new book is beside herself. Um, Elizabeth, how would you describe this book to someone who's new to you and your writing Um, who do you think would love this book? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. I, I don't even know. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, it's called women's fiction. Um, I don't think only women can read it, but probably maybe that will be the majority of the people who read it. Um, yeah, and, I love the story. I, I I hate some of those designations. I know. I don't this know what to, great, I don't to say. This was a thing. I want anybody who wants to read it. To read yeah, it, but it's, it's a about, great character story. What, what did you say? I said it's a great character story. Oh, thank you. And it's about a family and, you know, the ups and downs. And in the background, the Eagles are, are a big part of, you know, the Philadelphia <laughs> backdrop. So that could appeal to a lot of people. And there's food and, you know, there are a lot of different different things going on. Um, so, yeah, I hope it appeals to many, many people. Well, I'm glad you brought up the food because in, in a lot of your books that – that's a, a theme, and I know it. You know, kind of beginning with the restaurant critic's wife, and yeah. and this is you in your real life, and right. um, it, it kind of feels like a kind of a wink and a nod to people that have been following along. Do, yeah. do you ever do that in books to put little things in there for people that have been reading along? They say, "Oh, I'll, I'll bet my, you know, my my true readers will will like to see that." Well, so for a long time, I would always I tried to get you know, like a mention of the restaurant critic, but I, I sort of stopped that. I think I actually 
had that in an initial draft of this book, but I don't think it's in anymore. Um, and I, I mean, I like that to do that. I love talking about Philadelphia restaurants. I, I don't want to overdo it, but in this book, um, you know, one of my favorite restaurants makes a, a big appearance for different parts of Hannah and Joel's life. It's a really important um, place for them. And I did that on purpose because it's a place I love and I loved writing about it. And I loved going back and being there when I was thinking about the scenes. So in a way that's sort of, you know, it's a way for me to, to be in a place I love. Um, and then there's a big coffee theme in this book. And um, my husband and I don't always agree about coffee. And I sort of have that theme <laughs> running through with different characters. And I like that. So I don't know if it's a nod to people who would really see it beyond just, oh, there she's talking about food again. Um, but but it's the, there, those are the things I'm taking from my real life and sort of putting in the book to move the story forward and to bring the characters to life. I mean, that's my intention, but I do, I do like to, to bring things that I love into the, into the books. Well, the book is fantastic. It's out oh, everywhere now beside you. herself um, is available in paperback and uh, Kindle edition and audio book. Um, do you, do you love audio books? I do. Oh, I love them. And you know, we listen to audio books when we have a long drive and I hope, People, maybe some people will choose my book, but I do. I love audiobooks. Do you? I do. I do. I, uh, it's, it's really the only way that I can keep this, keep up to date with, of with course. the show is listening to, you know, people's back catalog and audio and stuff like that. And I absolutely love of it. Of course. Um, but Beside Herself is out everywhere now. We highly encourage you to go grab a copy. There's links to it in the show notes. Um, Elizabeth, if people are just learning about you and want to connect with you online, is there a place where they can do that? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm on Facebook as Elizabeth LeBan, and I have a website, ElizabethLeBan.com, and I'm also on Instagram and Twitter as Elizabeth LeBan, and I would love to connect with people. Fantastic. I'll put links to all those in the show notes Thank of this you. episode. Um, Elizabeth, this has been so much fun talking. Um, we're going to send everyone to pick up a copy of Beside Herself and to, to connect with you. Thank you for joining Thank me you. today. Thank you so much. It's so great to talk to you. I love this. Thank you. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Welcome to historic Sleepy Hollow, settled in 1640. Jason had looped around the town and had come up Broadway from the south. Behind the retaining wall next to the sign, a yard worker turned on his leaf blower, sending a tidal wave of yellow and red up and over the stones to splash off the windshield of the RV. They passed antique shops, a shell station, and a food king grocery. This is the same Broadway, you know, said Eliza. It goes all the way down to Times Square. Used to be an Indian trail, Manhattan to Fort Orange. For the fur trapping business. She kissed the dog. Oh, don't worry, baby. Nobody's gonna skin you. And you know what the town's most famous for? Well, duh, Jason said. Every kid named Crane, especially one as tall and skinny as Jason, had heard a lifetime of Ichabod jokes. He hoped never to hear another. Did you know it was a real place? Of course, he said, though he hadn't. Don't be so smart, said Eliza. Turn here. The streets sloped towards the Hudson, the hillside trying to shake the village off its back. Jason slipped in behind a UPS truck and drove upwards. They turned onto Gory Brook Road. He stuck his head out the window, trying to pass. The UPS truck turned aside to the right. And he saw the house. Here, 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 said Eliza. She pointed at the driveway of 417 Gory Brook. Jason brought the RV to a smoke-belching halt. The house stood on a knoll, above a steep yard that angled downwards toward the Hudson. An ancient sycamore on the front lawn leaned precariously. The roof was an irregular A-frame, with a long slope on the left and a short one on the right, like a rotated checkmark. The upper floors were trimmed with bands of chocolate-brown wood in a rectangular pattern. They made the house look as if it were trapped behind the bars of a jail cell. A tiny, triangular portico extended over the front door, which was rough-hewn, rounded on top, held together by two vertical metal bands, and dotted with nail heads. A gothic novel in braille. The gray-blue curtains at the ground floor bay window gave the place a veiled eye aspect, like his grandmother's cataracts. 
The house seemed to be inspecting Jason with that eye. What are you doing here, boy? I'm watching you. Eliza put a hand on his shoulder. He jumped. This is it, she said. She slapped the dashboard. This is what? Our new home. But... Jason turned to her, baffled. Her face sparkled with delight. Surprise! 